Good evening, and welcome to this great discussion that we're having tonight. I am Norman Hartman, the chair for the Mayor's Commission on Unity, Diversity, and Prosperity. Uh, we have a panel discussion lined up regarding connecting law enforcement to the community. Uh, this is an event in, in connection with the Mayor's Commission. Uh, we have had a series of conversations where we've been engaging the community, uh, retracing our history through lynching and racial terrorism. In 2018, we had an opportunity to go to Montgomery, Alabama and visit the National Memorial for Peace and Justice and uh, were tasked with beginning the Community Remembrance Project where we trek through this pathway. And as a community, the Mayor's Commission, we have started these discussions um, beginning in March of this year. Um, our second discussion we had in July with our uh, MCSD panel and now we have a esteemed panel here that I'm just going to introduce in just a moment. Uh, for those that have joined the live feed, we in, in, invite you to join the discussion by using the chat feature. Uh, you can uh, respectfully post, but once we get to the question and answer phase, you have an opportunity to share your questions. I will pick those questions up uh, later within the discussion and share that with our esteemed panel. Just a few introductions of our panelists that we have here this evening and our moderator. Uh, we have first Chief Freddie Blackman. Um, Chief Freddie Blackman began his career with the Columbus Police Department as police officer on April 7, 1986. As police officer, he served in the 9-11 Center, Bureau of Patrol Services, Tactical Squad, and Gang Task Force. As a detective, he worked in the Vice and Narcotic Squad as a sergeant, he served in the Bureau of Patrol Services, Vice and Narcotics Squad, Metro Narcotics Task Force, the Juvenile Diversion Unit, and Training Division. As a lieutenant, he worked in the Bureau of Patrol Services, Robbery and Homicide, Unit and Director of Training Divisions, while assigned to the Crisis Negotiation Team and Commander for the Mobile Field Force Team. As a captain, he was the Human Resources Director for the Columbus Police Department. As police major, he was in charge of the Office of Professional Standards. Chief Blackman has a Master's of Science degree in Human Resource Management and a Bachelor in Science degree in Criminal Justice from Troy State University. He completed management development training through the University of Georgia. Also, he completed Leadership Columbus and graduated from the 265th session of the FBI National Academy. Chief Bennett, we're glad to have you with us this evening, and thank you for joining us. Chief Laura Bennett began serving as Chief of Columbus State University uh, Police on May 1st, 2021. Congratulations. She began her career at the University of West Georgia Police Department in August of 1989. During her tenure at the University of West Georgia, she participated in the FBI's Police Executive Fellowship with the honor of being the first person accepted from a college or university. After serving 28 years at the University of West Georgia Police Department, she began the next step of her journey at Columbus State University Police Department as Assistant Chief. She has dedicated her entire career to policing in the higher education environment. Chief Bennett has a Master's of Public Safety Administration from Columbus State University and a Bachelor of Science degree in Criminology from the University of West Georgia. She is also uh, a graduate of the University of Louis Louisville's Southern Police Institute Administrative Offices course. I will at this time introduce our moderator and I will also introduce uh, Greg Countryman. So our moderator for this evening is Reverend Valerie Allison Thompson. She is the oldest girl of seven children born to Reverend and Miss, Mrs. Rudolph Allen Sr. She was educated in the Muskogee County School System and University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin, Mercer University in Macon, Georgia, and the Interdenominational Theological Center in Atlanta, Georgia. Reverend Thompson is the senior pastor of Revelation Missionary Baptist Church, where she has served for 16 years she received a Community Service Award from the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and the Woman of the Year Award from Ross Report News Atlanta, Georgia. Reverend Thompson has received the Woman of Courage Award
from the Greater Columbus Business and Professional Women's Club. She served on the Board of Community Development, Developmental Advisory Council for the City of Columbus. Pastor Thompson is on the Board of Directors for the Urban League of Greater Columbus Incorporated, the Minority Board of Directors for the American Red Cross and past Vice President of the Interdenominational Ministerial Alliance of Columbus, Georgia. In 2019, after the retirement of Mayor Pro Tem Evelyn Pugh, Pastor Thompson was appointed to fill her seat as counselor by the mayor of Columbus, Georgia. In February of 2020, Pastor Thompson became the first woman to sit on the cabinet of the General Missionary Baptist Convention of Georgia in 150 years. What an accomplishment. She is married to the Reverend Reginald A. Thompson, son of the late Reverend Tony Thompson and Miss Melinda Colbert. They have four children, eight grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. Reverend Thompson's continuous confession is Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In the interest of time, I do apologize, uh, Sheriff Countryman, but we do have our Sheriff um, uh, Greg Countryman here with us today, who is our esteemed sheriff. Uh, and um, I will come back later and we'll introduce you um, so that e everyone has an opportunity to hear your bio. But at this time, we do want to move forward in our program. We thank you, um, Pastor uh, Thompson, for moderating for us this evening. And so we'll pass the baton to you to continue forward and begin us with this discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Norman. Uh, I just want to say that I am honored to uh, sit among such esteemed uh, law enforcement uh, officers, Chief Blackman, Chief uh, Bennett, and also Sheriff Countryman. And we all know uh, what we have faced in several years, not only in our city of Columbus, but also nationally. So uh, we're going to dive right into some questions that have been presented to us and uh, in any order that you would like to answer them. Uh, the first question is how do we address the concern of racism and bias in law enforcement locally? Well, one of the things that um Um, I think that one of the things that we need to focus on is training. Um, I think that one of the things that we need to focus on is training, and there is training that's out there. And anytime we start talking um, about biases and um, and differences between cultures and the community in law enforcement, uh, we understand that we serve a multicultural community. And so one of the things that I focus on in the past is making sure um, that we understand fair and impartial policing, mm -hmm. that we understand um, collective biases that no matter what side you're on, that we all have biases. Um, um, some are implicit, some are complicit biases. Um, and the internal biases can sometimes um, um, come out at different times. But when we go through the training and, we'll, and when we can sit down and we can understand the various cultures that we actually serve, um, there used to be a time that we would say protect and serve. But now that needs to be turned around to serve and protect. Mm -hmm. uh, that we need to better understand the communities that we do serve, um, understand the various cultures that are, that, are, that are out there and what may be offensive some cultures may not be offensive to the other culture. And some, in, in my 30 years, that I've learned that, that what some may perceive um, as racism or something like that is um, it can be misunderstood for the way that a person was raised, but they just didn't mean anything by that because if they're raised in an environment to where they are taught that what they're doing is correct, mm -hmm. and so whenever they get in a, another environment, that they don't know anything about and they act out something or they may say something and not realize the offense that it caused, it can cause a lot of friction, especially if it's not corrected or recognized um, um, and if they don't apologize for it. So I think one of the things that we need to do in law enforcement 
um, it's better training in that area. So as you begin to talk about training, uh, is this offered as they come into the sheriff's office during um, the initial? We actually, uh, we actually have that program started and that's something that we are implementing. Um, when, I was, when I was marshal, every deputy had to go through that and as, and as sheriff, that's something that we're integrating into our own um, um, training program because when we can sit down and, um, and when we listen to each other, um, and there are sometimes differences, and, and sometimes they come out. But mm -hmm. if we don't talk about things and understand how it impacts other people, um, if we can understand that in the workplace, then when we go out into the community, we can better understand it because we've already seen it up close. Right. So, um, and I do want uh, Chief Blackman, that you've been it, to answer this, but I do want to ask this question. As you, um, as it come to uh, the Sheriff's Department, if you have officers that you do know have been involved with racism or are biased, do they go back to training or how do we address that here in, in Columbus? Well, fortunately, I hadn't had to test that yet, okay. um, but I am zero tolerance regardless of what side it's on. Okay. Um, I think that we should serve the whole community. It doesn't matter what zip code you live in, um, doesn't matter what party you believe um, um, that you belong to, whether if you're white collar, blue collar, or no collar, mm -hmm. um, that we serve mm -hmm. a multicultural community and we serve a one Columbus. Right. Amen. Chief Bennett. Hi, thank you. Um, I agree with the, the training concept as well, but I'd also like to add to it that I feel like conversations like this and conversations that we can have with our community where we actively listen with the intent of understanding. And I think that is so vitally important. And if you give your community opportunities to uh, express their concerns, either uh, anonymously or in control groups uh, where they feel like their voice can be heard. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that is a huge step in the right direction of you know, just understanding where someone is coming from, just understanding the path that led them here and what they see may not be the same thing that you see. You know, when I walk the streets of Columbus, I feel very safe, but I'm also armed. And, you know, does that make a difference in perception for me? It probably does. And, you know, when I have my students walking through campus downtown or on the main campus, I want them to feel safe. I want them to know that the police officers are there and they're looking out for them and, you know, hear their concerns. So, you know, if we take the, the training and go a little step further and just actively listen, what they got to say, I think it goes a long way. Chief Blackman. Okay, so as far as training, as far as training uh, to ensure our officers are definitely made aware that there is no place, I, I totally agree with that, but to, to go even before that, from a recruitment standpoint. And, and you must understand this, when, when we have an applicant to apply, we do a very extensive background to ensure that we're able to identify the strengths as well as weaknesses for the particular applicant. And of course, we try to get as much information as we can in addition to that, once the individual is, is, is brought on board, we will continue to train and do racial uh, profile training as well. I, I remember when I was in training division, I, I would teach those particular classes as I was assigned as a recruit sergeant. And that continues on even now to ensure our officers know to measure each individual based on the act that occurred and not their race or their gender. And so 
we are definitely of the mindset to continue to train to ensure that we treat people with respect and we treat everyone fair to ensure that we carry a message that everyone, everyone will be treated in a very fair and consistent manner and not mistreated. And, and racism is something that would absolutely not be tolerated. Let, let me ask this question. Um, you said that once they, uh, during the process of them coming aboard, is there mental, a mental as evaluation of those candidates that are coming aboard? Yes. Extensive right. mental right. Right. So, evaluation. Exactly. So as a part of our background process, and when the individual, when the applicant, as a part of their process before they are able to get to a pre-interview or a final interview, mm -hmm. there is a psychological assessment that takes place. And it's, it's very detailed and, and not everyone, uh, will, not every applicant will pass his psychological okay. profile. And so we may, just, just to say, we may receive, just to use a number, we may receive 100 applicants, but typically from that 100, we may hire anywhere from eight to 10 officers from that 100 applicants. So you see, we need a very wide pool because right. for various reasons to include a psychological profile, an applicant may not be able to advance forward. Very good. Um, of course, everyone in Columbus, Georgia, uh, we're concerned about the crime that uh, is taking place here and how it has gone up over the years. What are the main stems of violent crime here in our city? Say the main stems. Mm -hmm. Crime, uh, it, it, it is present and it has been present over the course of the years. So we, we would definitely do our part to address it. We've seen various components of the reason why crime occurs, and I'm speaking more of violent crimes. Uh, we've seen in not every situation, but just about. Uh, I would say 98% of our violent crimes, individuals know one another. So there's a situation where individuals <clears throat> have a difficult time resolving an issue, whether it's domestic related or someone who is meeting up trying to make a drug transaction, mm -hmm. or it could be a situation where someone's just having a verbal dispute and they result in a violent act to try to resolve that matter. <clears throat> but, but we all know that's not the way it should be resolved. So with that in mind, and if you heard me say on several occasions in the past, one of the components to, to address our violent crime issue, of course we're gonna do our part from an enforcement standpoint, but we definitely need the other facets to take place such as our uh, mental health providers and our educational providers, uh, business community, social services community. There are so many other c components, including our parents, because we have to, in order to change behavior, we have to change mindsets. Mm -hmm. Individuals have to understand that certain behaviors should not take place and will not be considered as acceptable. Sheriff? I think that the police chief covered it. And we keep changing. But, but I think that the police chief um, covered it well. And when, when you have um, alcohol present, um, along with mental health issues, especially mental health issues that, that, that have gone unchecked, um, that, that is a disaster. Mm -hmm. And so um, a lot of times that we see that alcohol will play part and um, in, in people making wrong decisions, um, but also poverty and opportunity. Okay. And that's a, my opinion that, the, that right at the tip of making someone do something right versus wrong is opportunity. You can either create 
better opportunities. Um, or sometimes people are just um, in a bad place at the bad time and they become a part of their environment. And so, um, but I, over the past six or seven months, I've watched the age group between 18 and 24. Um, and I've looked at some of the things that have happened and as the chief um, uh, said earlier that these are people that know each, each other and they can't resolve a lot of problems. Um, and so, and that's scary. That is very, very scary. And when I walk through the county jail and when I walk into the different cells and, and when I speak with some of these young men, they're very remorseful, but the incident has already happened. And you will be shocked at how much mental health issues are involved in crime. We may have 900, and I believe the count today at the county jail was about 963. But of that 963, over 350 have been diagnosed with mental health issues. Some of them are slight, but some of them are ex extremely severe. And so these are the people that law enforcement are coming in contact with. But when you have alcohol and you have drugs, um, oftentimes involved in these in these things, they elevate to um, to something that is volatile and something that is dangerous. So how do we offset this? How can the community, and I know that, and I have heard several times that a lot of people put the blame on the police department, the sheriff department, that uh, you know, you all are not doing a, a good job. And I know personally there's no way that you're going to know where a shooting is going to uh, take place or where a crime is going to take place. But my question is, how do we as citizens connect or join in with law enforcement to help in offsetting the crime that's going on? What can we do, even, even the faith-based community? Uh, what can we do? Because I do know that there's a lot of programs that have been started in Columbus, and we start them, but they never come to fruition. Uh, we talk about what we need to do, but we never do what we need to do. So that's the question. How can we, as community partners, work with law enforcement towards building, first of all, trust, um, building trust with the community and protecting that trust that we have and, and also how do we connect with each other to see what we can do to kind of offset what is going on in our great city of Columbus, Georgia. Since I've started as the chief of police, there have been many times when I've been in various sessions like this, panel discussions or or in other various places, always communicate that building trust with our community is something that's extremely important for the Columbus Police Department. We have to get out into our community, literally interact with our community, and listen to their concerns, and be able to explain why we do what we do and so there's a better understanding from, from, from the citizens listening to the law enforcement officers. Because if we don't have the citizens trust, then they're not going to call upon us to assist. So building trust is paramount. And, and so that works that towards being able to receive contact information from our citizens, because our citizens are in places at various times and they are aware of certain incidents that have occurred. As was stated earlier, we have law enforcement officers in our city, but we are not in the position where we are every corner throughout the day or night, but our citizens are. And so as they develop that trust and, and, and share information with us, that's a help. In addition to that, of course, 
we will continue to follow our intelligent information and, and patrol in hotspot locations. But you can only work so much at, from a law enforcement standpoint because that's one dimension as far as from the enforcement and making the rest. That's effective, but it's something that is one dimensional. We've, we've got to have a multi-dimensional approach being that law enforcement and being able to have our community to share information with us. And then we have to have those other components that we spoke of earlier, being able to interact with individuals mm -hmm. and provide services as they are needed as individuals who show the propensity to have weaknesses in certain areas. So we have to address those matters and focus on education, focus on situations where individuals are put into a position where their mindset would be changed and, 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 and where they understand that certain behaviors are not acceptable. We have to have strong mental health assessments and being able to have follow-ups and treatment to go along with that initial assessment. So we have individuals that are diagnosed, but the question is, do we have treatment processes in place to provide assistance to help them along the way? So individuals can function with mental health with the proper treatment. And so it's all inclusive. That's what we really have to focus on. Um, I think that um, relationships are built from both sides. Um, that one thing that I do, one thing I would want to emphasize to the listeners is that what you see happening in other cities, don't judge us based on the same thing right. that you see. Um, because if that's, the, if that's the plum that you measure us by, then you're going you're gonna to look at someone that's a good officer. And I think in Columbus, Georgia, and Muskogee County, Columbus Police Department and Sheriff's Office, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. And I know for a fact that some of the issues that we see happening nationally, we don't have that here. And that's one thing that I'm very, very confident in that because we are so connected to the community, whether if you call the mayor's office or, or, you know, or the police department or the sheriff's office, we get on things so fast, or Columbus State, or whoever it is, but we get on things so fast that we don't allow it time to fester. And so if they say that it's a problem, we try to address it and we try to nip it in the most diplomatic way that we possibly can. And what we do in the sheriff's office is that our deputies have to go out and that they have to speak with five citizens every single day, whether if they are business owners, whether if they are whether if they're parked on the side of the road and somebody's cutting grass, they wait until the lawnmower go off and they go and talk to them, they give them a car, and try to build that re relationship with them because there's nothing more positive than seeing a law enforcement officer um, in, the, in the neighborhood, um, you know, playing, uh, playing basketball with kids. I've seen Chief Blackman go into neighborhoods himself and play basketball with the kids. That's one of the greatest billboards uh, because now, that you have created a positive mindset for those kids. So when they go back and they, um, whenever they go back and tell the parents something, that's the greatest billboard that you can have. Now you've planted a seed, and now when they see the uniform, it's something good um, that we're getting ready to re-implement um, Operation Safe Schools to where, in, to where our deputies can just go into the schools and just walk through the schools with the, with the principal's permission and allow the kids to see them in a positive way because normally when they see a uniform, something bad has happened. And so we have got to adjust the way that, we have to adjust the uh, perception of the way that people look at us. But I can say that we're not gonna get it 100% right all the time. Do we have some guys that we need to deal with? Absolutely. But for the most part, I would say 95% or 96% of the people that we have working for us are good people. And these are the same people that when you call and when you need help, that when you see those blue lights and sirens going 
Portia, those people have families. They don't know if they're going to come home or not. But they don't care what zip code you live in. They don't care what color you are. All they know is that they have a job to do, and they're going to try to do it to the best of their ability. So I would hope that over the next few years that we can restore that public trust to where we can build a to where we can build a solid foundation, a solid bridge to where it can withstand whatever happens in our community. I, CSU has done a, a couple of things or made a couple of changes that, that I feel like uh, is, is adding to our relationship with the community. And, you know, we're constant partners to the Sheriff's Department, to the Police Department. We train together. Uh, we attend activities together. National Night Out was a great success. We had an awesome time uh, going out into the communities. But uh, I have made changes in my department with uh, community relations. In, in the past, we had one person that was the primary point of contact, and he attended and went out to all events and did an amazing job. But the downfall to that was no one knew the other officers. And I have a whole department full of good officers black, white, male, female, and they should see them all. So, you know, we've, we've changed the mentality. You know, every officer is a community relations officer. Mm -hmm. And it's not one person's responsibility, it's all of our responsibilities. Right. We have also tripled the number of events in the community that we're doing this year. And, you know, no one person is leading that. I have different people coordinating each event and is giving everybody an opportunity to have uh, ownership of these events and uh, show off their talents and their commitment to the community. And uh, it's actually very refreshing to see the officers take such great joy in uh, planning these events and going out into the community. And I've, I've loved seeing the growth in, of their work, and it's amazing. And, and I'm glad uh, what you said, uh, Sheriff Countryman, about uh, Chief Blackman playing basketball, because that was one of the questions that I was going to ask. What is the interaction with the community outside of crime? And mo especially our kids, uh, they are afraid of policemen and sheriffs. And when they see the car coming, most of them are running. Uh, so that was a question that I was going to ask. What is the interaction with not only our kids, but also with our adults outside of a crime happening? So interaction really is unlimited as far as the different types of interactions we can have with our community. As far as our children from our elementary age, we can go into the schools and interact with them, which, which we do, uh, as well as through our, throughout our middle and high school level, and even into our college level. We interact with our students there. And then as far as our adults, of course, we have our Citizens Law Enforcement Academy, where individuals can contact our, our office and sign up to attend one of the sessions. And when I say one of the sessions, this, a session is a 16-week session where citizens will receive the opportunity to learn more about the law enforcement uh, in our city uh, between the Muscogee County Sheriff's Office as well as the Columbus Police Department. We have officers and, and, the, and the sheriff have deputies that will lead discussions throughout those 16 weeks so individuals will gain a better understanding as to what takes place within the Columbus Police Department or what takes place within the Muscogee County Sheriff's Office. And so we know that we, we had a session that was in place. We, we were put on hold for a while due to COVID, but we are anxiously awaiting to be able to resume and we look at, we, we're looking at being able to resume next month with the class that was put on hold but and of course we will be practicing our social distancing and ensuring safety for everyone present but 
in those classes, the individuals who will attend will gain a great understanding as to what takes place. And they will really be able to have like a behind the scenes type look because it's not information that you, you, you would see every day or just uh, hear just watching TV. But the information that's shared is more introspective information that gives a broader scope, a uh, greater look as to what actually takes place in the various units within our department. We, in addition to that, we have a pastor's academy mm -hmm. where we uh, share information with the clergy throughout our city and be able to bring them up to date as to what's taking place so that they will be able to use that information as they interact with their congregations. And so, uh, and that's just some of the interaction that we have with our community. Uh, you know, as, as Chief Bennett stated, we do national night out that we are all over the city. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so we continue to look for ways, even more ways to, to develop opportunities to interact and, and we'll be even more creative even more creative as we go forward and find ways to develop contact with our citizens. And you know, we have, we've developed uh, an Asian liaison officer because we, we realize, as Sheriff Countryman stated earlier, uh, everyone has a different viewpoint of law enforcement officers. But we want everyone to be able to trust us and so we want to meet them where they are. So we have some Asian officers within our department that we've established as liaison officers so they can work with our Asian community and be able to create that opportunity to, to explain what we're doing as a law enforcement agency and why we're doing what we're doing and then be able to address their concerns as well. Same thing with our Hispanic community. We have a Hispanic liaison officer that is able to interact even more in our Hispanic community. So we're doing uh, interactions throughout our community and look forward to doing even more interaction through our segments, our youth, our middle age, mm -hmm. our young adults, and our adults, even our seniors. Uh, we have uh, a community uh, program uh, called Columbus Against Drugs. And that group has a diverse membership uh, for as age, uh, race, and gender that we're able to in interact with them as well. And so we're just looking forward to continued interaction as we work and help to develop a stronger bond with our citizenship. Before you speak, uh, Sheriff, because I know you have something to say about interaction, I want to say that as a pastor, I did go through the uh, Pastors Academy, and it just gave me a greater respect, not only for the police department, but also for the officers that are on the street. So I want to say thank you so much for, uh, for that. Thank you, and thank you for attending. Thank you very much. Um, we offer, uh, we have a community outreach unit that actually goes into the community uh, that we deal with everything from dealing with the um, autism community. Um, um, if there is someone, if there's a senior citizen in the community that's having a birthday, um, mm -hmm. you know, we give the escort and we actually go out and we physically um, um, give a happy birthday mm -hmm. to that person. Um, and I've been in those convoys with them before, um, but we do a lot of real-time interaction things through social media because social media is one of the greatest ways to interact with the citizens that we serve. And um, on our social media page, it's nothing for me to go on and make comments, mm -hmm. even if it's something um, to actually bring calm to something that they may see happening in the happening in the city. But we post a lot of things on our social media page um, in the spirit of transparency and even that interaction there, that's direct interaction. And so that allows them to see that law enforcement is real. We don't, you know, we don't have an admin person doing it. I interact with it or either some of our command staff can interact with it. Um, but we go into the community, we go into the senior homes, anything that deals with the community, 
we want to leave an imprint. And so um, a lot of our guys, we want the community to laugh a lot. And so our guys will interact with the community. We go into different restaurants. Um, uh, when there's a restaurant full of people, we make sure that we say something to the people at the table. So when they leave there, we want them to have a positive thought about law enforcement. And so, so you know, it's just a matter of us making it a practice. We generally look at, at different ways that we can support the community by going out into the schools. Uh, Shaw High School, we've done several uh, hiring days with them. We've done several trunk or treats with different uh, churches and schools. And, you know, we had an officer today going to a pre-K just so that she could show off the police car and hand out badges. And it's, it's the tiny little commitment that we make to the community that makes a big difference. Great. I do understand we have some, uh, Mr. Hartman, have some questions that have come in. Yes, um, the listening audience is very interested in the conversation we're having. So I'm not sure if this first question uh, impacts you all directly or indirectly, but as I understand it, there are cameras that can be set up in particular neighborhoods that can um, maybe provide some security to, to residents and um, provide some aid to you all as well in your research. So what would be the process um, of a person or, or a resident requesting some type of surveillance in an area? And then uh, the second question would be, what benefit does that have to the community and to you all in your research? Okay, since we've been the board, we, we're working with our administration side of our department in developing a, a very, very effective camera program. Uh, surveillance cameras have proven to be very effective in, in assisting us in our investigations. And so we, we've met with some of our neighborhood groups and given information as far as what our plan is going forward with cameras and we will be meeting with even more of our neighborhood groups in doing so. If there is someone who wants to schedule a, an officer to come and meet with them to explain even more information regarding the camera program because we want to be able to get a system that is able to integrate with, with, with what we're uh, utilizing. And so that way the systems can marry up together. So if neighborhoods are interest, interested in doing that, then by all means they should call the my office at 706-653-3100 and we would definitely uh, route them to the person that they need to speak with so that they would be able to have one of those meetings set up in their neighborhood and we would come to your neighborhood to give you additional information regarding cameras. Great, thank you for answering that question. Um, we had a lot of questions come in as it pertains to building trust and knowing that citizens can trust the process. So a uh, two part question um, is how do we know as citizens that um, people are not being unfairly targeted. And if people are being unfairly targeted, what's the follow-up process that citizens can check into that and be sure that things are being conducted properly? Well, our department is an accredited agency, nationally accredited through the Commission on Accreditation for Law Enforcement Agencies. We refer to that as CALEA. And we're also state certified. <clears throat> through the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police. Uh, that's referred to as GACP. And so through that national accreditation and state certification, we have oversight. Or, or in other words, because of the accreditation process, there, there are certain interactions that we have within our department where we have oversight our supervisors have oversight of what takes place with those whom they supervise. So our supervisors will have the opportunity to review uh, video footage through personnel complaints 
as they are filed. And of course, previously I was major over the Office of Professional Standards. And so that's the, the clearinghouse, so to speak, or the keeper of the record of the personnel complaints that comes in. So just to give you an example, an individual can receive a personnel complaint form by going to our website or they can come to our police department if they wish, or they can send a letter in to our department or email. And they, we've even investigated anonymous complaints and just to see what's taking place. So an individual files a complaint and the, the supervisor would investigate the complaint. And upon that initial supervisor investigating the complaint and, and, and rendering a decision on that complaint, then that complaint is then forwarded to the next supervisor at the next level in that chain of command. That supervisor will review the complaint to ensure compliance with our departmental policies. And then the next level is, in other words, a complaint is reviewed from a sergeant level through the chief of police level. And so that means the sergeant, the lieutenant, the captain, the deputy chief, the deputy chief over offices of the Office of Professional Standards, the assistant chief, and the chief will review a complaint. And in addition to that, because we, we are nationally uh, accredited, we have assessors that will come in and assess us on an annual basis to review documents, or whether it's a personnel complaint, whether it's a use of force, uh, whether it's a vehicle pursuit, they will review our documentation to ensure that it is compliant. In addition to that, you know, every four years we come up for reaccreditation, and so those assessors would actually come on site here in Columbus and will hold a town hall meeting to listen to anyone in our community. They were advertised that they're here and anyone who has any concerns about our officers are welcome to come to that meeting, <coughs> send, an, send an email, make a phone call. We will establish a phone line for the individual to call and voice their concerns. If there's any concern that they have about what our process is and what our officers did, they had that opportunity. And so we take treating our citizens fairly, very seriously. And we would not tolerate the mistreatment of any citizen. Uh, CSU operates very similarly uh, to CPD. One of the things, and I'm sure that Chief Blackman also has this, is early warning systems. So you have uh, methods in place to track when an officer has had uh, numerous complaints. And, you know, when a person has had a few complaints, that should be looked at. There's a, a trend or a pattern. And so by having those things in place, uh, it, it's kind of like the checks and balances to make sure that we're operating fairly and consistently. And, you know, you know one person's not getting away with something that, you know, another person would uh, get by with, you know. So it's very similar. And I think that any time a citizen feel like that he or she has been mistreated, that they should always go to, um, to the agency and perhaps ask for a supervisor or come down for a sit down visit because I think that when you can sit down face to face and when we can look at something because um, as I mentioned earlier that it's how people perceive and receive things that an officer may have said that well I didn't mean anything by it or, or either maybe they did but the only way to get to the bottom of it is is to sit down and openly um, have a conversation about it because we can't say that how a person should feel um, because that's up to them how, how they actually feel. But um, I think that when people um, go to social media and, you know, and take problems to, so, to um, social media that sometimes emotions can get in, um, um, involved in things. And other people that may have had something similar that have emotions 
And that really doesn't get you anywhere because we're talking about re restoring and building trust. And how do we build trust? We build trust uh, by trying to learn each other. And so uh, when we can talk things out and talk things through um, and understand what policies are, that is so much better. And because I've had to deal with one or two issues um, since I've been sheriff and, and it wasn't as bad as what people thought. And what they wanted more than anything was just a listening ear. Absolutely, great responses. And we have uh, a few questions as it pertains to racial profiling and training. So um, first part of the question is, how is uh, racial profiling worked into your training process or modules? And how do you uh, respond to current events um, that may be happening in other places and uh, consider that in your training? We do a lot of roll call training, um, spontaneous training, um, that we talk about these type of issues openly, um, even when it doesn't make someone feel comfortable. Um, we would rather challenge, we would, we would rather prick the conscience in the, in the hearts of people because when we see things happening nationally, we want to make sure that that doesn't come in our backyard. And so when we see things happening like that, sometimes um, the real people come out. And, and so sometimes we need to know who those real people are. And sometimes whenever we have these conversations, it says a lot and sometimes it's a teachable moment. But I think that we should always have these type of moments. And we do a lot of roll call um, uh, training and we do a lot of what if type of training. Um, because when you can what if something and when that's put into practice, when you, um, when you interact with the community and let's say that, that, that something similar comes up to, you revert back to what you've been trained on. And so as long as we can have this type of training, um, it helps to calm problems when we have interactions with the, um, um, with the general public. I think another way to uh, help and add with that is just having a diverse police department, uh, looking to have uh, an Asian uh, liaison, uh, trying to balance the number of black and white officers and male and female and Hispanic. And if you have a good representation, I think a lot of those issues kind of naturally work themselves out. Right, I, I agree with the Chief. With that, in addition to that, when our officers are at the recruit stage as far as when they've graduated from the police academy, then they come to our training division and they receive training before they go to their field training officer. And so while they're in that particular training mode, they receive classes uh, where and one of the classes is a class regarding racial profiling because we want our officers to be very much aware that racial profiling is illegal. And so as far as seeing other incidents that have occurred in various departments, we use those as training opportunities as well to ensure that that's not duplicated in our department. Absolutely. <laughs> and. Um, we had a question come in to ask, uh, are you all working with other uh, county uh, officers and departments in terms of getting your ideas and um, improving what we have here and maybe sharing across different counties in Georgia? Absolutely. Um, since I've been in law enforcement, um, since I've been an agency head, that's something that I've done for the past 16 years. Um, because when you look at what's going on in other cities and how they get through issues, um, it's never like what we do here. Because if we only deal with what we have here in Columbus, um, that we may be um, hitting our head up against the wall. And I was on the phone with, uh, well not on the phone, but on the Zoom call earlier with the sheriff from Gwinnett County, DeKalb County, Fulton County, Henry County, um, you know, because we talk oftentimes about the issues that we have here, programs, and how can we better serve our community. 
and I have gotten some of the best wisdom and we've um, implemented programs not only in our county jail for uh, behavior modification, but, we, but, but we've also implemented programs within our own community that has um, enhanced relationships. It's real easy to go back to the places that you know or the relationships that you have built. I've had some great mentors and they have gone on to other universities and colleges and I've been able to draw upon their wisdom and build relationships with them. So, you know, every relationship that we build is an opportunity and, you know, now that my role has changed some, I try to make sure that I have returned the favor and mentor others and offer advice and talk out problems and I think it uh, goes a long way in our uh, community. Also, what I do is rely on the contacts I've been able to establish over the years. Uh, of course, the contacts that I made uh, has been uh, in the FBI National Academy, where I was able to establish contacts literally throughout the United States and around the world, and, and be able to bounce off different ideas with, with those individuals that I trained with there. Uh, in addition to that, we are able to go to uh, a Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police training conferences. And so and I know that uh, Chief Bennett is able to go to that conference and the sheriff go to the sheriff's conferences as well. But at those conferences, we are able to interact with chiefs or, or sheriffs all over the state of Georgia. And we'll be able to share ideas and uh, thoughts regarding what takes place and, and then even that, you know, uh, I've been able to make contact with the Atlanta police chief, uh, the Savannah police chief, uh, the chief of police in LaGrange, uh, talked to the chief in Montgomery, uh, working with similar sized cities uh, to see what they have experienced. Even the, the uh, sheriff and, 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 the, and the chief deputy from Augusta, Richmond, where they provide police and sheriff services. Uh, I communicate with them as well. And so, and there are others that we communicate with to bounce around ideas and just to see what is it that they're doing and, and they do the same thing with us to see what we're doing to ensure that we're all on the same page as we provide the services to our communities. I have one more question, and uh, this has been asked throughout our city. What are we doing to retain officers here in Columbus, Georgia? Because it has been said that we are the training site for uh, other cities, for other states. So uh, let us tell our listening and viewing audience what we are doing um, to retain officers here in Columbus. Okay. so. My focus on retention, which I'm very familiar with as far as that being a concern. Uh, we, we've had retention problems really for, for several years. And I, I remember even as I was in our human resource uh, director position, you know, it was even more something that I dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis as far as trying to bring up ideas or thoughts or suggestions. But as a chief, one focus that I do as far as retention is to ensure that our officers have a very, very good idea that they're working for a professional organization. And I want to make sure that they're working for an organization that has strong leadership, and that will treat them as human beings, treat them fairly, and ensure that they receive the best possible interactions with their supervisors as well as the coworkers. We want to make sure we have a good working environment. First, we know that some officers may decide to leave for uh, salary reasons. Some officers decide to leave for work hours reasons. In fact, recently we've adjusted our work schedule 
to, in the effort to address our retention concerns because several officers were concerned about the work schedule in which they were assigned with working uh, a certain number of consecutive days in, in their work schedule. So we recently addressed the work schedule and, and we are just really now about five days into that to see uh, how that will take shape. So we will assess our new schedule for a few months to see how effective that is. But, but we definitely understand that there are various concerns. So one person may leave because the way the market is now, it is, it's a very good market to find jobs in other areas. And so uh, especially the way the climate is regarding law enforcement. So we take all of that into consideration and work to, to provide the best, the best possible work environment for a person to work in. So we want to make sure that our officers are trained in the very top level of training and so that they're comfortable with doing their jobs. And then as a result of that, they'll be able to go forth and provide the best possible service to the citizens that we serve. Retention at the university has uh, been a challenge. Um, I've tried to do uh, different things to offer incentives. Uh, I've relaxed the facial hair policy and tattoo policy, um, which is surprisingly enough uh, helped morale. And uh, I've looked into uh, equipment that they've wished to wear, like uh, external vest. Uh, it says it takes some of the uh, weight of the gun belt off of their back. And that's been a very um, proactive uh, approach to retention and offering as much training as I can. Uh, I want all of our officers to have um, a focus in an area that they want to train, whether it's supervision or management, or they want to uh, do drug recognition, or you know, want to support their desires for their path. And uh, I try to focus the training in that direction. And, you know, treat them like family. That's, that's how I want to be treated. And um, I care about all of my officers, and I think they do a great job. And I only look to hire the best, so I'm hoping it's a good environment. Um, I, I echo what Chief Bennett is saying, um, that I've had to relax uh, some of the policies that I have at the jail in order to improve morale. But what I do is that I started, I have an inverted approach to where instead of getting the answers from the top, I go down to the line level. And that's something that I've been dealing with because rather than people complaining all the time, when I deal with them now and when I meet with the line level officers, uh, I find out so much because they will bring you problems. But I ask them, well, bring me solutions. Because if you say that this is the problem, tell me how you would fix it. And so what I've started allowing them to do to give them the lati latitude in some cases, whatever you are complaining about, let's see how you fix the problem. And so that has worked out in some cases, um, but just relaxing policies and just finding out what it, what it is that they're looking for. Because when you look at the trend, this is a national, this is just not a local and a state, this is the national um, pandemic in which I call it. Um, that when we're competing local government with other companies, um, that can pay more. Um, we have people, um, we had an incident within the sheriff's office recently that a person that has been there for a long time, this is the decision to leave, but it's, but it's about him taking care of his family versus him making more money although that we provide a good work environment, um, in some cases, it's all about the money. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the trend of those that are leaving, um, it's that 21 to 34 group, but that's gonna be everywhere. And so um, this is a generational thing, and we have to understand that is, is that there are certain generations that are now generations, that they're not wor worried about jeopardy, they're not worried about retirement, 
um, is what can you do for me now? And so, because a lot of those uh, numbers that you look and see that the, that the length of time that they spend with the company is between one and three years in agency, and they're saying, look, I've given you three years, I'm going somewhere else. And so, um, but it's about having a good quality agency and being able to offer something different um, because we have to recognize that these things are going to happen, but we want to try to uh, minimize it so that we're not hemorrhaging. Mm -hmm. And so I'm very creative, and whatever I have to do, we do, but I get a lot of em employee buy-in from them. As we begin to wrap up, I want to say thank you to Chief Blackman, to Chief Bennett, and to Sheriff Countryman for being here tonight. This has been a very insightful and knowledgeable conversation, and I hope that those that are viewing have, have a greater understanding of what it takes uh, in law enforcement to be in this community. And, and that we will try to join forces, that Columbus, Georgia will be a better place to live. So again, thank you so much for being here tonight. And thank you, Mr. Hartman, for allowing me to be the moderator on tonight. We wouldn't have had it any other way. Uh, Reverend uh, Thompson, you have done a great job this evening. Uh, we just have maybe uh, 10 more minutes that we're going to go through some closing thoughts here. But I, uh, Sheriff, I want to get you in there. We didn't get a chance to hear your bio earlier, so I don't want to shortchange you. Uh, <laughs> but as, you, as being a man of the cloth, you understand giving honor to whom honor is due. Uh, Sheriff Greg Countryman was born in Plains, Georgia. He is happily married to his lovely wife, Angela Countryman. They have been blessed with three sons. He is a 30-year law enforcement professional. Prior to being elected sheriff, he served 16 years as the elected marshal of Muskogee County. Countryman was also a part of the Muskogee County Sheriff's Office family, welcome back home, where he had the distinct honor of serving in the following divisions, field services, courts, fugitives, and the jail. Sheriff Greg Countryman is a 21st century thinker who believes in serving the community as a whole and leaving an imprint in the minds of those we serve. He leads by example and does not mind helping to serve in many capacities to get the job done. He is a 1984 graduate of Baker High School. He obtained an associate's degree from Georgia Military College, bachelor of science degree from Troy State University, master of public administration degree from Columbus State University, and a master of arts in practical theology and ministry from Ohio, Ohio Christian University. He was also bestowed a Doctor of Philosophy in Christian Counseling from St. Thomas Christian University. He is a graduate of Georgia Regional Command College, class number 26, and also attended FBI Leeds training. Sheriff Greg Countryman is a former assistant adjunct professor with Georgia Military College. Uh, Sheriff Greg Countryman is a member of several organizations to include Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity Incorporated, Electric City Masonic Lodge, number 322, American Legion Lodge, 267, SAL member, National Organization of Black Law Executives, Police Benevolent Association, Fraternal Order of Police, Georgia Sheriff's Association, and the Georgia Association of Chiefs of Police. Thank you again for your contribution to tonight's discussion. So many great things that we've heard. Uh, one of the things that we've been trying to do is really focus on the interaction between the groups that we have leading the discussion and the community because we have so many pillars that affect our community and tonight we so happen to be focusing on law enforcement. One of the things that I heard uh, many of you talk about is being available and open for communities to contact you to voice their uh, questions and concerns. And I think that's where the rubber meets the road as it pertains to this partnership and interaction. So those that are listening, uh, we want to encourage you to do just that, to rally your neighbors, to find out what um, neighborhood watch programs are near you and get involved in what they're doing. Uh, this is not something that you can go at alone or should go at alone, but you should go out as a community and a neighborhood and you have um, our task force, both our 
uh, police departments, if you have um, part of the city, if you have university students, and we have our sheriff's office for the county where you can reach out to them. And I'm sure that they will be amenable to coming up with ideas that work for you in the community. We've heard several things as involved in their um, security camera uh, programming systems. We've heard even as it pertains to complaints that you have. Maybe there are some people that um, they don't know how to file a complaint. Maybe they don't know how to voice that. You can be that voice for them. Uh, you can be a, uh, a preventative voice in, in, as, it, as it pertains to taking action as well. So we want to thank you again for being here. Um, we also want to encourage everyone to continue the discussion and to know that these discussions will continue. So we have already had our discussion uh, with our uh, Muskogee County School District. We've had it with our officers of Columbus. Our next conversation in October um, to, to look out for will be with our corporate partners. And by corporate partners, I mean those that provide jobs and opportunities here in Columbus. And so we want to know that how they are tackling issues as it pertains to uh, cultural flourishing and diversity. Um, because uh, economics is also a huge part of this cultural flourishing. Again, uh, this project has uh, been birthed out of the Community Remembrance Project out of Montgomery, Alabama, where we're claiming and reclaiming our history around lynching and racial terrorism. And we ultimately want to include the social welfare of uh, those who have been terrorized in our community and those who are the descendants of those who have been terrorized. And so there is much more to come. If something that um, was said tonight sparked conversation um, or questions that I, as the chair of the Mayor's Commission on Unity, Diversity, and Prosperity, can entertain, please contact me. My email address is normane.hardman at gmail.com. I would love to have your uh, questions and concerns, or if you want to get involved in this initiative. We're just getting started. There's much more to, to come. So with that, I want to thank our moderator, as well as our panelists, again. Um, we also have our mayor present. I want to thank him as well for giving us the opportunity to do this and supporting this. We have a mayor who cares. So um, thank you again for spending your evening with us, and we look forward to seeing you very, very soon. Take care. <laughs>